Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And I think we have a number of questions that came in to our form and one saved up from previous weeks. So let's see what can we start with here. There is one from Frost asking, is 10 a special number in any way? Why is scientific notation in base 10? Is it just because we have five times two fingers? but lots of flowers have five-fold symmetry and so on. Well, interesting question. So how did we wind up with five fingers, for example? How does five end up being an important number in biology uh, with many things, with, uh, with things like five-fold symmetry or five of something? You know, the fossil record tells us something about that. Uh, if we go back, mm, I don't know, 500, 700 million years to um, the uh, uh, like the Precambrian period, uh, when there were when there was mostly uh, there was just life in the oceans and so on. And the question is, what kind of critters existed at that time? And we know from samples like there's this thing called the Burgess Shale in Canada that uh, has some very ancient organisms that look really bizarre. They don't look like modern organisms at all but they have all kinds of strange tentacles and other structures on them. And a bunch of those organisms don't have the five-fold symmetry that we're used to today. They don't have five of things. They have some threes and sevens and, and maybe nines and so on. And uh, so it seems like there was a competition in early life for sort of what was the best number to have as your, well, in the end for us, number of fingers, but uh, for other things, kind of um, uh, number of segments or, or number, of, uh, uh, number of things around a circle, those kinds of things. And it seems like for some reason, five won out. Now, why did that happen? Uh, it could have been sort of purely coincidental. It could have been almost an accident. Um, it could have been because somehow three is too few, seven is too many, uh, odd numbers are better than even numbers because you don't want things to sort of uh, line up on the two sides or whatever else. We don't, we don't know. Um, the fact that we have uh, given that sort of we are 10 based, uh, you know, we, we've got a lot of um, uh, tenniness in us, so to speak. Uh, it is only natural that our mathematics has reflected that. But certainly not all mathematics and history has worked that way. For example, the first kind of mathematics that we sort of systematically know about is Babylonian mathematics from, well, now about 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. And uh, uh, that the, in Babylonian mathematics, 60 was the main thing used. It was like you count up to 60 and then you use 60 as the next unit and you keep going. That 60 is where we got our minutes in an hour and so on from, um, and eventually seconds in a minute. Um, it's also where uh, it was at first assumed that there were 360 days in a year. That's where we get our 360 degrees in a circle from. Um, so for, for quite a while in the history of mathematics, base 60 was the thing that was used. And base 60 is very convenient because 60 has many divisors. That is, there are many ways that you can split 60 in halves and thirds in quarters and so on, and still end up with whole numbers. And that's useful if you're saying, well, I've got, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll have some amount of barley, let's say, and I want to give a quarter of it to so-and-so and, -so and, a, and uh, a quarter of it to somebody else. Well, it's still a whole number of pieces of barley. If you started off with 60 pieces of barley um, in, your, in your original collection. So 60 is very convenient from that point of view. Now, in uh, uh, people uh, 10, pe people occasionally say, well, a dozen is a more convenient number to use for various commercial purposes and so on. And, uh, uh, in fact, I think it's been sort of going out of fashion, but um, uh, quite a few things are kind of sold by the dozen, sold by the 12, because again, 12 has, has uh, is three times two times two, and that means that it has 
it, you can you know, divide it in two, divide it in three, divide it in, in four, and so on, and uh, you still get whole numbers, and that's convenient. Now, people have uh, occasionally proposed different kinds of, well, let, let's change our, our system. You know, for instance, um, there are ideas like, you know, isn't it awkward that there are seven days in a week? Let's change that to some rounder number, whatever that means, or let's uh, change the number of uh, you know, hours in the day, months in the year, all these kinds of things. I think these are uh, cases where perhaps um, uh, just by virtue of uh, familiarity, um, it's, it's uh, sort of the numbers that we're used to are the numbers that we'll tend to continue to want to have. Uh, I've, I've uh, mentioned a number of times in, in England where I grew up, the currency used to be based on uh, having uh, 12 pennies in a shilling, 20 shillings in a pound. Um, and that was something which, again, I suspect had grown up. I suspect it was a holdover from Roman times. Um, it had grown up because of this divisibility property of those kinds of numbers. Uh, now, in, in terms of uh, uh, this, there's this whole question about uh, metric units versus non-metric units. Should we really be dealing with, you know, 12 inches in a um, uh, in a foot? you know, three feet in a yard, 1760 yards in a mile, these are very weird numbers. You know, why not, as uh, Napoleon pushed back in 1800 or so, um, have uh, a metric system where everything is based on, on tens? Um, and uh, in much of the world, that's been what's happened. Um, but again, sort of there's a, there's a weight of familiarity in, uh, in the US and the UK and so on to keep um, uh, these kind of traditional units. And I have to say that now that we have uh, computers to compute things, it's probably less important to worry about um, uh, to the, the fact that it's a little messier to do these computations with these mixed radix systems. I mean, in, in uh, usually when we're dealing with base 10, we have, uh, you know, there's the ones column, ones digits, the tens digits, the hundred digits and so on. When we're dealing with, uh, for example, traditional British currency, it would be the, the pennies, and then, the, then there's a factor of 12 to the shillings, then there's a factor of 20 to the pounds, and so on. And it's a mixed radix. It has, does not have a fixed multiplier for every successive digit. Um, I think uh, it's, it's always interesting to see, kind of in, when, in Wolfram Alpha, we try and provide answers in the sort of local units of whatever country the person is making the query from. And some things are rather easy to deal with, um, lengths, you know, uh, feet and inches versus uh, um, meters, centimeters, uh, temperature, Fahrenheit versus Celsius. But there are some slightly more exotic ones like air pressure, uh, as you know, quoted on, on the weather, uh, you know, when people quote the weather and so on. There's a lot more diversity in how that's quoted, whether it's millimeters of mercury, uh, whether it's um, hectopascals, whether it's, um, uh, uh, gosh, what are the other ones? Um, atmospheres, tor, um, which is millimeters of mercury, and so on. It's kind of a, a strange country dependent thing, what that's quoted in, and there are just conversions between those. Let's see. Uh, Parmenides contributes this, um, this comment that Empedocles apparently believed that arms and fingers and legs roamed around as separate creatures on their own, eventually merging into, into the, um, the creatures that won out. Okay, that's, that's interesting. It's, it's always interesting to see in kind of uh, uh, ancient writings, this kind of how did people imagine that things came to be the way they are? You know, what was the story behind, you know, how did the zebra get its stripes? How did the leopard get its spots? Um, how did, uh, uh, how did the, you know, the, the moon end up being circular when viewed from the earth, all those kinds of things. And it's, it's, it's always interesting to see what kind of models and ideas people had about how things came to be the way they are. Um, sometimes to us today, those models seem incredibly kind of primitive and how could they possibly have thought that? 
um, I, when I see those kinds of things, I, I think to myself, what of things that we say today will at some time in the future seem to, to people then to be similarly naive? Um, Well, there's some questions. Okay, there's a biology question from Aaron here. Why are some animals cold-blooded? Well, first of all, I should explain what, what that means. So things like uh, lizards, insects. Well, lizards, let's take lizards. Um, the, uh, to be cold-blooded means that there is no internal regulation of the temperature of the blood. So, for example, in us humans, the... The typical temperature of our blood, typical sort of core body temperature is roughly 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 degrees Celsius. Um, and uh, we, when we're sort of in our normal operating conditions, uh, we maintain that body temperature. That's maintained by, I guess, the hypothalamus and the brain is maintaining uh, things are the, the, the main source of heat in our bodies is, well, the, the brain is a big source of heat, but the main source of heat that regulates things tends to be the liver um, and uh, sort of producing, it has chemical reactions going on that produce heat. And the, our brains regulate the, um, the temperature of our, of our bodies. And they do that by using the fact that certain chemical reactions um, uh, have the rates of those chemical reactions depend on temperature. And that's kind of the way that we measure temperature for purposes of, of being able to regulate our own temperature. And when we get sick, for example, one of the ways that our body tries to make it unpleasant for the, for the viruses and bacteria um, is uh, to increase our body temperature, to make it more difficult for those things to, to replicate and so on. Um, and that's uh, a mechanism that is mediated by our brains and that our immune system, when our immune system kind of uh, uh, gets the, the, the alert that there's an intruder, um, it will tend to, um, to increase body temperature. I have to say that the, uh, many years ago, I, I managed to break my ankle doing something very stupid, but that's a different story, um, the, uh, on, on some ice. Um, but uh, uh, I was, I was uh, very surprised to see that my, you know, within a few minutes, my body temperature had gone up to like 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I, didn't, I, I, I just didn't know that when one had kind of uh, just trauma to one's tissue like that, that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I guess it's kind of a, a big alert for the... Um, uh, uh, innate immune system and so on to go and start um, uh, generating cascades of, of, uh, uh, of chemicals to sort of help heal the site and so on. And one consequence of that is increase of body temperature. Well, this idea of um, having regulated body temperature is something that only the, uh, that's a recent idea for, you know, birds and mammals and so on. And that's an idea that doesn't exist for, for reptiles. For reptiles, um, it's the, the temperature that uh, the, is, is based on the, the ambient temperature. They don't regulate their own temperature. And so that means that you know, if, you, if you keep lizards or something, they'll tend to get, if they get cold, they'll tend to get very kind of sleepy. And if you put a heat lamp on them, they'll, they'll suddenly um, wake up and, and act like a sort of humans with coffee or something. Um, the, uh, I think, that's, that's one of, it's, it's very curious that if you look at the kind of tree of life on earth, that there are these kind of discrete divisions into things like, you know, reptiles, birds, mammals. Now they're obviously, they're creatures that are kind of on the edge where does it really count as a mammal? Well, it's, it lays eggs, but nevertheless, it's warm blooded and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're kind of corner cases, but for the most part, the sort of the tree of life breaks in these very, very large chunks. And often those large chunks are associated with a particular innovation. But sometimes those, those chunks, there's, once you have one innovation, it allows other innovations. Once you are able to, you know, uh, sort of um, gestate your young internally, so to speak, maybe that's related to being able to have 
uh, well, that's that the, not quite being able to have body uh, regulation of body temperature because that happens a little bit earlier in in the in evolutionary history. But um, uh, it's it kind of feels like once you have a certain innovation that kind of opens up many possibilities for how an organism should work. So, so for example, if you're um, uh, an insect or something, you don't have lungs that allow you to kind of suck in air and bring, um, and um, uh, you don't have a, a, a circulatory system that allows you to deliver oxygen to all your tissues. So instead you just have these kind of tubes that, that um, uh, bring, that have to bring um, uh, bring oxygen into tissues, and there's a maximum length to those that's determined by essentially physical constraints. And so there's kind of a maximum size that those organisms can get to before they've had this other innovation um, that uh, allows them to get bigger. And so I think there are often these correlations between once you have sort of one invention, then other inventions come along with it, are, are made possible. And it kind of reminds one a lot of the history of technology where kind of the idea of computers suddenly opens up all these different kinds of things. And suddenly you can have drones and you can have uh, all sorts of different kinds of things. Um, so that one innovation leads to kind of a cascade of other innovations. And I think one sees the same kind of thing in uh, biological organisms. And that's, um, uh, that's, that's what, what happens there. Well, let's see. Uh, the questions here. There's one from Yun here. Can our Wolfram Physics project be used to simulate models of new medications for diseases? You know, if you'd asked me that a couple of years ago when we were first getting ready to launch our physics project, I would have said, absolutely not, nothing to do with it. But actually now I would say, yes, there's some very close connections and they're pretty interesting. So let me try and describe that a bit. I mean, our, our physics project has to do with understanding kind of the low level structure of our physical universe, kind of what is space made out of, um, how do particles work, how does gravity work, how does quantum mechanics work, and so on. But one of the things that's come out of that project is this understanding of kind of a formal structure of, well, we think that space is made from this very large number of discrete atoms of space that are all getting updated sort of independently and that are getting updated in these different, there are many different possible updates that can happen. And somehow when we observe what happens in the universe, we are kind of straddling many of those different possible paths of history because we ourselves are kind of branching into many different paths of history, just like the rest of the universe does. And so as we perceive the rest of the universe, we're kind of, conflating together those different branches of history because those different branches of history are also part of us. So that whole rather complicated story, I call it kind of the multi-computational paradigm for thinking about things, this idea of, of things are, there are computations going on, they're just sort of following rules, computing the next state, et cetera, but this is happening in multiple paths. And there's this kind of idea that you have these multiple paths of history, but we are, we as observers of that are kind of sampling many of those paths and kind of combining them together to conclude what we actually perceive. So that whole story turns into kind of a mathematical structure of things called multi-way systems. And uh, ultimately this thing we call the Rouliad, which is this kind of entangled combination of all possible computations, a very complicated sounding thing, and it is, in a sense, the most complicated thing we can imagine in the universe. Um, and among the things that are in it is our physical universe. But from all of that sort of complicated story comes this kind of formal structure, this formalism for describing how systems work. And we applied that formalism in physics and we can see kind of how that formalism plays out, how that formalism gives us the notion of space, the notion of time, the notion of gravity, things like this. But it turns out that formalism can also be used in other places. And the fact that it's the same formalism that's being used in other places and in physics lets us do things like take ideas from physics, like ideas like black holes and so on, and transport those to other fields. 
So one of the fields that looks to be uh, a place where you can transport it to is thinking about molecular biology. So normally when we think about biology, it's we think about organisms and creatures and all that kind of thing. But uh, over the last 50 years or so, a big part of biology is molecular biology, the study of, of the molecular structure of biological organisms. And we are, the, uh, and uh, the, the kind of, you know, our organisms consist of cells within cells. There are little organelles that are, are the, the sort of the, the, the different functional parts of a cell. And in general, most of a cell is made up from uh, proteins which are long, typically big molecules that are made of, of uh, separate units. There are about 20 amino acids that are these kind of clumps of atoms that combine together in a sequence to form proteins. And we humans have, I don't know, 30,000 different kinds of proteins or something um, that are sort of uh, maybe, yeah, about that, that are kind of, that, that make up us. Well, the, um, the question, that is sort of a key question in, in biology and in molecular biology is all these proteins, they are inside cells and they interact with each other in complicated ways. And those complicated interactions and their interactions with the DNA in our cells and all sorts of other things, all those things uh, make us alive and make us be able to do all the things that we can do. And the question is sort of, what's the way to describe what's going on there? We can say, well, for example, a very typical way that one describes things in molecular biology is to say, oh, when there's an increased concentration of this thing, it produces an incre increased concentration of that thing, which decreases the concentration of that thing. And the result of that is that one starts uh, producing more of some kind of chemical, and that makes one do this or that. Um, the, uh, that, 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 for example, I don't know, uh, I was mentioning body temperature, uh, that increases your body temperature, or that makes you uh, able to be more active, or it makes you, um, uh, or it um, uh, produces um, uh, produces things that allow your brain to operate, or, or whatever else. But so the question is kind of how to describe these processes in molecular biology, and what's very typical is that you'll have uh, like you know there's a there's a big wall chart that I think one could still get, it's now in, in two giant sort of uh, uh, sections that shows kind of all the pathways that are known pretty much in, in cells that exist in things like humans. And there are pathways that are associated with these kind of cycles going from one chemical to another that eventually produce energy. There are other things that are responsible for the replication of cells, other things that are responsible for, I don't know, immune response, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, these different processes that go on in biology. And one is used to seeing these, these kind of descriptions of those processes, just saying what really matters is the concentration of these different chemicals. Well, if you've been doing chemistry, oh, I don't know, 100 years ago or something now, uh, that would have been the story as well, that everything is about the concentration of different chemicals. And for example, when people have been building chemical plants, that produce some particular kind of uh, kind of chemical. The big story of chemical engineering has to do with uh, we've got this concentration of this thing, and that produces a concentration of that thing, and so on. Um, there's a sort of a, a little footnote in chemistry, which is the idea of catalysts, um, where, for example, you can have different chemicals, and the rate at which they interact depends on. Uh, what, what you can you can have some some solid, for example, often the chemicals are are liquids or gases, and you will have a, a solid surface. And as the molecules kind of get um, attached to the solid surface, they line themselves up in such a way that they can more easily interact with another chemical, and that can increase the rate of chemical reactions. That's sort of a, a, a something goes a little bit beyond just saying, what's the total concentration of this chemical and that chemical, and that's what will determine the chemical processes that are going on. But in a first approximation, that's the story. And similarly, in, in biology from, from uh, back, uh, well, if you've gone back, I don't know, 80 years or something, that would be, um, uh, the story of how you would imagine that biology had to work at a sort of chemical, biochemical level. But then 
big discovery was made, 1953, uh, that DNA was a single molecule that could store lots of information. A single molecule that way we, we didn't just have to say, oh, it's a it's a hemoglobin molecule or something, or it's a molecule has some other name. You had to say both it's a DNA molecule and it has this particular genetic code. So I mentioned that proteins are made up of these strings of amino acids. Um, the uh, any particular protein, hemoglobin happens to be one. I don't know, actin. Uh, ferritin, lots of different um, proteins that make us up. Each protein has a certain uh, specific sequence of amino acids that make up that protein. Well, uh, for DNA, it's a sequence of, a, of nucleic acids. And um, the, uh, um, the, the thing that exists there is that there can be, the DNA molecule is, can have any sequence of these base pairs. And so instead of just being a particular, instead of just saying it's a DNA molecule, that's all we have to say about it. We actually have to say, well, it's a DNA molecule with the sequence A, T, G, C, A, T, T, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that can go on for, for a billion uh, base pairs and it can store essentially a billion bits of information. So, so that single molecule can kind of pack in tons of information. And that information is what our, uh, through the mechanisms of, of uh, that's, that's what specifies how proteins should be constructed and so on in our cells. So right now in molecular biology, one imagines that, well, yes, there are these individual DNA molecules and RNA molecules that can have store all this information, but when it comes to the other molecules that are hanging around in one's cells, like proteins and so on, once you know it's this kind of protein or that kind of protein, that's all you need to know. It's not clear that that's correct. There's another possibility. When you look at the interactions between these molecules, you typically will just, the only thing you'll usually be asking is, right now, is what's the total concentration of each molecule? How many molecules are there of this particular kind? But actually there's a lot more information that matters. For example, it could be the case that these two molecules, they collided with each other, they reacted, they exchanged some atoms, they changed their structure, then they break apart again, they go off, and then, well, maybe those two same molecules come back and collide again, but the state of the, the state that they were in matters to how what happens when they subsequently collide, or alternatively, this whole kind of, you can make this whole kind of network of the sort of histories of individual atoms. And that is much more detailed information than just saying, oh, there's a total of this number of this kind of atom. Instead, you've got this whole dance of what's happening to each atom or each, each molecule, I should say. And um, uh, you, you can either say, what's the total concentration of these molecules? Or you can ask kind of, what's the whole dance of the interactions between these molecules? It's my guess that there's actually a lot of information in molecular biology that is essentially stored in this sort of dynamical, you know, uh, the progression with time of which molecule interacts with which one and how does that, how does that molecule then come back and interact with the other molecule again and so on. So in other words, that it isn't just the concentration of chemicals that matters to the operation of biological systems, but also this much more detailed choreography, much more detailed kind of uh, arrangement of, of uh, the, which molecule interacts with which other one and, and which particular molecule is then going to do some other interaction and so on. And so it's my guess that that is important in the operation of biological organisms and that perhaps that's part of what one has been missing in not being able to explain in sort of the big picture, many features of how biological organisms work and phenomena like aging and so on, which have been a little difficult to make sort of a, a large scale statement about. And, um, uh, and similarly also the operation of the immune system, where we know a certain amount about how it works, but there are lots of mysteries about how it works. And perhaps part of the reason for that is that we're kind of looking at the wrong aspects of, of, of the system. And we have to look more at this kind of dynamical network of what's going on. So uh, that, um, so our physics project 
provides kind of a formalism for thinking about those kinds of dynamic networks, because it's exactly those dynamic networks in our physics project that make up the structure of physical space. Well, we can apply the same ideas to understand these kind of networks of interaction between molecules and so on. And I think that might be really important for understanding how biological systems work, particularly in something like the immune system, where we know that there are interactions between these immune system cells. We don't really have a good way of representing or thinking about the sort of dynamical interactions between these cells, different from just the, the there's a, there's a, some nasty antigen that comes in from the outside and it, collectively uh, some number of different uh, you know, antibodies are produced or some such other thing. This is asking within that whole con collection of antibodies and B cells and T cells and all this kind of thing, what is the kind of, uh, what are the, all the interactions between those different kinds of cells that happen uh, in, in the immune system? So, uh, the, the kind of the thought there is uh, perhaps these, these kinds of dynamical processes are important for understanding biology. And if you're interested in making drugs, for example, that have biological effects, those may be things that are important to take into account. The typical drug, uh, the, its, its basic strategy is be a molecule of a certain shape and fit into a molecule of another shape and have an effect on it. So some drugs will inhibit some particular process by, if there's some protein, for example, proteins are usually folded up in some complicated shape and they'll have little, little sort of holes in, in the side of the protein from, from where, the, uh, where the atoms and the protein were arranged. There'll be some little hole and some other molecule just very conveniently fits into that hole and causes the protein to do this or that thing. And that's part of how, uh, how the biological organism works. But if you can have a drug that will fit into that hole where the other molecule is supposed to go in and it'll lock itself into that hole, it prevents the other molecule from getting in there. And that's kind of a, a mechanism that a drug can use or alternatively it can, it can do sort of the opposite and, and uh, make some change, attach itself somewhere to a protein and make it easier for another molecule to attach itself and to have something happen. So a very typical kind of strategy for drugs for there are a couple of thousand, a couple of thousand drugs that have been uh, uh, developed. Well, there are more that have been developed. That's the number that are in use. Um, the uh, uh, and they all have different detailed strategies. But it's very often this kind of uh, sort of puzzle piece fitting together kind of idea that they make use of. Now, there's a question of what if it matters what kind of the dynamical processes the of 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 the kind of uh, the the um, how these molecules move around and interact with each other and then reinteract and so on. How does that affect what one can do in terms of uh, uh, making changes to the system through introducing other molecules? Well, it's an interesting question. I think that question is is most uh, immediate for the immune system, where uh, there are things that are clearly happening in the immune system, sometimes leading to diseases like autoimmune diseases, where the immune system is, is more active than it should be. And that's quite possibly something to do with the interaction of the immune system with itself and these kind of uh, dynamical processes. And so there's a question of, of can, one, uh, can one go in and uh, make use of the ideas that we have from our physics project to kind of see what would you actually have to do to change those dynamical processes to have an effect on how the immune system works. So those are, those are a few ideas there. Um, I think that the, the main thing is kind of what's the strategy by which some particular drug should work? Is it fit into this particular hole? What, what's the particular target that the drug should, should, uh, should go for? And often those targets are very directly sort of physical pieces, physical uh, uh, sort of constructs in, in protein molecules or, or whatever else. This is a somewhat more a complicated target because it's a target which involves kind of the time dependence of what's going on. And you know, one of the things that I think is an early challenge there is if indeed it's important what this kind of time history of interactions between molecules is like, can one measure that in, in biology? 
can one measure what, what's going on at that level? One of the tricks that has been used a lot to uh, understand things in, at the genomic level, to understand what is the sequence of this piece of DNA or RNA or whatever else, um, is uh, this technique called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, where essentially what one is doing is taking, is, is making many, many copies of a particular sequence that exists in RNA or DNA. And one's, uh, one has something, one typically goes through many cycles where one's doubling the number of, of, uh, of copies at every cycle. So, you know, people in, in trying to detect, for example, the uh, RNA from viruses and things like that, um, people will sort of say, oh, you know, we saw a signal with 20 uh, cycles of PCR, which means that there were uh, 20 doublings. So there were two to the 20th copies of whatever the initial thing was, or maybe it we needed 40 cycles of PCR to see a signal. So that means there were two to the 40th um, uh, uh, multiplication of, of the original concentration of that DNA molecule. But so what PCR does is it tells you a particular sequence um, that exists in RNA that may be a sequence that exists in the virus you're trying to look for and doesn't exist anywhere in us humans, PCR allows you to amplify that sequence and see whether it's present in a particular sample. So what one would need is kind of an analog of that to amplify the effects of these kind of dynamical processes and see was there this particular cycle of these particular molecules present in this, uh, in this system. But I don't know how to do that yet. And that's kind of a, a challenge to invent something like PCR that is sensitive to dynamical processes in cells rather than the static, just the static structure of, of a DNA molecule or something. Let's see. Uh, well. Um, it's a question here. I think I talked about this in another, another session here, but there's a question here about cryonics and freezing humans and so on. And uh, it's, uh, I've often felt that there are these different moments in kind of medical discovery when people suddenly are able to do something that they were never able to do before. So for example, antibiotics, uh, drugs that will kill bacterial cells and leave our eukaryotic, our sort of uh, higher, higher animal type cells un unaffected. And sort of the idea that one could have a molecule that would kind of attack bacteria and not attack higher organism cells. That was something that, that was from the 1930s, 40s. Um, that was kind of a dramatic uh, sort of um, uh, moment in the history of medicine. Um, in, in kind of biology in general, another moment that, well, uh, uh, many, many of these things, I mean, the, the idea of stem cells, and the idea of being able to, uh, the idea that, so, so in, in us, we have, oh, maybe a few thousand different types of cells, from hair cells to brain cells to muscle cells, all these different kinds of cells. Yet, we all start off from just a single cell. And the question is, how do we differentiate into all these different kinds of cells? And so, if you want to, for example, replace some kind of cells, a, a, a sort of uh, um, famous example of that is uh, uh, replacing the beta cells of the pancreas that produce insulin. Um, if you want to replace cells in uh, uh, what you would like to be able to do is to sort of rerun the process of going from that single, single egg cell to all the different kinds of cell types that exist in, in us humans as, as we are as sort of adult humans. Um, and the question is, how do you, how does that differentiation occur? Um, and uh, 
for a long time, it was really not known at all how that occurred. Because what happens is every cell in our bodies has the same ultimate DNA, the same basic instructions about what proteins it, it can make. But what happens in different cell types is that different parts of that DNA are activated and different parts of that DNA um, uh, get, get to make the proteins that, that make hair or, or, uh, or brain cells or lung cells or whatever else. And so it was, it was quite mysterious what, uh, what was the mechanism by which those different parts of, one's, of the DNA in a particular cell got activated. And, um, the, uh, uh, and it was finally more or less figured out, I don't know, a couple of decades ago, um, more or less how that works um, and how different sort of things that, that attach to the DNA make it... Um, uh, and and different uh, different uh, different things that that uh, sort of promote the the um, the making of proteins from one part of the DNA rather rather than another part of the DNA. How that works and how different how sort of the starting off from this this initial kind of uh, single cell. How you end up with uh, this kind of cell followed by that kind of cell followed by that kind of cell. The whole kind of tree of what kinds of cells exist in humans. I don't think there's a complete map yet of that sort of tree of cells in humans. There's a particular kind of organism, the nematode, the C. elegans. It's a little kind of microscopic worm thing uh, where it is known in precise detail how every single cell in that organism, uh, how, it, how it is produced. It only has uh, a couple of thousand cells in it. Um, and. Uh, so it's sort of easier to trace what happens. And, and that particular organism with its couple of thousand cells, pretty much every organism is identical. Well, for us humans, there's like, well, you're going to have a big lump of, of nerve cells and different people will have those particular nerve cells arranged in detail in different ways. But in the, in the nematode and the C. elegans, they're really arranged in an identical way. And so in that particular case, the complete sort of uh, tree of how you go from the initial cell to all the particular, you know, muscle-like cells, and and uh, they even have some eye-like cells and brain cells and so on. How how those um, different kinds of cells arise? That's not, I think, completely known yet for us humans, and it's even not known how many types of cells really exist in humans. And uh, some are very obvious, but particularly among brain cells there can be many different variants. So among, well, types of blood cells, it's like, is it really a different type of cell because it has sort of different uh, things attached to the surface of the cell or, or not? Um, it's sort of a complicated story. But the thing that's been learned is how to go from a stem cell to a uh, two different kinds of cells. So I, I think um, like pancreatic beta cells, I think they're like 12 steps you have to go through. You go to this kind of cell, to that kind of cell, to that kind of cell, and eventually you wind up with a beta cell. And it's been slowly learned how to kind of coax cells to go through these different stages of division. It was for a while, it wasn't clear how you could get stem cells, so-called pluripotent um, the stem cells with the potential to turn into anything. Um, and it was thought the only way you could get them was to go back to fetal tissue and uh, go back to kind of... Um, where we all start from, so to speak, um, and, and go forward from there. But what was discovered, um, oh, I don't know what it was, 15 years ago maybe, was how to take sort of any old cell that we have and how to get it to go back to the state where it is not yet differentiated and to say, forget about all those special, uh, the special overlay that you have to tell you to turn into a skin cell, actually be a stem cell which can turn into any possible cell. And by the way, one of the reasons it's important to have uh, stem cells, you might say, why? Uh, well, it's, it, it, because each of us has a slightly different genetic code and our immune systems are keyed to our particular genetic code. That means if you want to, uh, the, for example, one thing you, you might try to do is to make cells that are a particular kind of cell for a particular person, so to speak. You can also make them generically 
sort of for for anybody. Um, but then then you end up you have that type of cell, but you still have the immune system of a particular person will tend to go and attack that cell. And in order to make use of these things medically, you have to suppress the immune system, or you have to enclose that cell in some kind of uh, in some kind of little bag where where like chemicals can go in and out that are useful, but the immune system can't get in to affect to to kind of um, notice that there's something foreign in there. Uh, I suppose one one of the things that's a, a recent um, kind of uh, uh, direction. I mean, people have been trying this for ages, but I think it's recently started to work. Is this idea of uh, uh, taking other animals, I don't know, pigs, whatever else, and giving them enough sort of uh, human-like genome uh, that that for the purpose of growing a particular kind of organ or a particular kind of cell, you can have those grow in a pig, for example, and then you can transplant them into a human. Um, and that's a, a medical for medical purposes. But I think the um, uh, this so um, anyway, this this um, uh, I was just saying that sort of if we look at the history of medicine and biology and so on, there are these moments where things get discovered, like stem cells, like how to coax cells and in, uh, in to differentiate them in particular ways, like how to edit a genome. Uh, it's it's now possible. There are all kinds of complicated restrictions and constraints, but basically, in theory, it's possible to. You know, we've imagined that our our DNA, whatever we're born with, is what we're stuck with. Um, we've known that there are retroviruses that can go in and try and uh, and insert little pieces into our DNA. And in fact, we can see in the history of human DNA there are lots of kinds of places where. That happened historically in the in the DNA that that gets passed down through our species, um, but it's now known how to actually go in and sort of on demand edit certain pieces of of our of our genome, and so that these different sort of moments where sort of a essentially basic research discovery gets made, and then it has many medical consequences. So another discovery that was made in the 1990s was how to do mammalian cloning, how to take an organism and make essentially a copy of that organism. And so it, uh, and that relates again to a lot of this stuff about stem cells and differentiation and so on. How do you like take a skin cell from, from a, an adult organism, for example, and go back and sort of replay the development of that organism from, uh, by, by, by taking that, that cell and going back and, um, uh, and being able to, to make a copy of the organism. And so that's been done for, well, all kinds of organisms. Um, it's, uh, people think it's a pretty bad idea to do it for humans. It was originally done for a sheep. Um, it's been done for uh, cats, I think. I think there's a, I think there was a, I don't know, it's still around, but there was a, a company called Copycat that would um, uh, copy your cat. The same with dogs, things like that. Um, the uh, uh, the question of sort of what is the clone like and is the clone sort of up to the standards of the original and so on, I think the general impression is that it, it more or less is. Maybe there are some slight uh, things that aren't quite uh, up to snuff for the original, but it's pretty close. But that's another thing that is kind of a, a, a sort of an idea that it's possible to do that. And, and for many years, people said, oh, yes, it's possible to clone lower organisms, but it'll never be possible to clone mammals. Why? Well, it's just too complicated. We don't know how to do it. So there wasn't really a good reason, but it was just nobody had figured out how to do it. And then there was this discovery made in the 1990s that did involve some pretty weird things like electrical shocks to cells and to, to egg cells and, th and things like this that um, uh, was some... Um, uh, yeah, I, sh I should have said that you don't need the whole stem cell story. What you need is to extract the DNA, to extract the genetic code for the organism that you want to make the copy of, extract that, which you can do from any cell in the body, and insert that into an egg cell and have that uh, be produce sort of the that, a copy of that same organism. But... Um, uh, but you still have this problem of, uh, well, if there's been something done to the DNA, that is what makes it be a skin cell rather than something else. You have to kind of reverse that out. But in any case, that, those are sort of examples of, 
of biological advances that, well, in the case of cloning, hasn't, I think, turned into uh, a particular medical advance, at least not for sort of uh, higher organisms, the concept of monoclonal antibodies, being able to just make lots and lots and lots of identical antibodies, that's become an important medical idea. But that's a quite, that's a different level of thing from the cloning a sheep type type idea. But so one of the things which, where it's like, well, nobody figured out how to do it yet, but there's no sort of proof that it's impossible, is how to freeze an organism and, um, and bring it back to life, so to speak. And people, there are fishes, for example, that get frozen in ice and, uh, you know, for a winter and then seem to be perfectly happy, uh, sort of uh, uh, coming back to life in the, in the spring kind of thing. And the question is, why doesn't that work for, uh, for us higher organisms? Why can't you just uh, uh, take a person and freeze them? And, you know, it's been an idea in science fiction forever. You know, you're going to go on a, a long space mission, you know, just freeze the people while the spacecraft is, is going to the, wherever it's going to go to and then, uh, you know, unfreeze them again. And, uh, uh, no, you know, that, that it's like they've just been been in suspended animation, so to speak, all of that time, and uh, it's, it's all good. The question is, can one actually do that in practice? The main problem is that we are full of water, and water is a substance that has the, the strange and annoying property that when it freezes into ice, it gets bigger. And most materials in their solid phase, when the, when the molecules are packed together, more closely, they're smaller than when they're in the liquid phase and all the molecules are, are jumping around. But water, for complicated reasons, doesn't have that property. It gets bigger when it freezes. And that has sort of a disastrous effect. And it's, you know, it happens when you put fruit in a freezer or something as well, that the, the water in, in, the, uh, in the tissue will expand. And that means that if it's inside a cell and the, the cell is, has a bunch of water in it, the, the water will expand and it will burst the cell walls. And so you get this kind of mushy mess of, uh, of sort of frozen fruit or something. And so the problem is, if you're gonna do that to a, an organism like us, um, that's absolutely not what you want to have happen. You want to have the cells be preserved and just the water in them frozen. What effect does it have to freeze them? Well, the reason that that is important is that the chemical reactions that uh, represent kind of us doing all the things we do when we're alive, those chemical reactions happen in liquid phase. They happen when the molecules are, are able to run around as they do in a liquid and interact with other molecules. If you freeze them into a solid, the molecules are locked in place and they can't have those kinds of reactions. And so it's as if, so the organism, whatever reactions lead the organism to get old, the organism to need to eat food, the organism to do all these kinds of things, all of those are stopped if you can just freeze it into solid form. And more to the point, the rate of reactions goes down as you decrease the temperature. And if you can make the temperature low enough, you can expect that the reactions will basically stop. And so then the question is, well, how do you get, is there a way to sort of freeze things without going through this awkward stage of the water expanding. And well, nobody knows how to do that. And so there are ideas of using sort of antifreeze type agents that will sort of avoid the, the place where, well, okay, so another thing I should explain, when, when water freezes into ice at zero degrees centigrade in, um, at standard pressure, then it has this feature that it gets bigger. If you can get water down to, I think it's minus 44 degrees centigrade, um, then it will turn into this phase um, that uh, um, is a kind of glossy phase. Instead of, in, in ice, that there are many different kinds of ice, but in ordinary ice, the molecules are arranged in this kind of hexagonal array, in a very regular hexagonal array. There are different kinds of ice. For example, if you're in a glacier, where there's ice under very high pressure, you'll get a different crystal arrangement. You'll get a different arrangement of water molecules. I think there are at least nine, 10 different kinds of, of structures of ice that are known that occur at different pressures and so on. But in any case, if you can get 
uh, water down to the point where it so-called vitrifies, which means that its molecules are all sort of frozen in place, but they're randomly arranged. They're not arranged in this kind of regular array that corresponds to a crystal. They're arranged in the way that, for example, molecules in glass are arranged where they're sort of all randomly, it's a solid more or less. I say more or less because even glass, like in a window, will slowly flow over the course of a century or something. It will slowly deform. And uh, that's a feature of the fact that the molecules are not like locked in place in this array as they are in a crystal. But uh, the, um, in the case of water, if you can get water down to the point where it is turning into this glassy phase, then it does not expand. Uh, that that phase is, is smaller than the liquid phase. And uh, the problem is getting from zero degrees centigrade to minus 44 degrees centigrade, uh, things don't just instantaneously cool down like that. To cool something down, what you're doing is you're removing heat from the thing, removing heat. Well, heat is the motion of molecules. That's what that heat, that, that's what heat is, is this energy associated with the motion of molecules. And so what you want to do is you want to quickly suck out that energy and get the temperature down to the point where, where when the molecules are down at that temperature, the, the water will not expand, it will not arrange itself in this, in this way that corresponds to a, a, a larger volume and so on. But nobody knows how to do that. Now, the, um, the sort of the good news, I suppose, is that uh, our, in our bodies, our bloodstream delivers oxygen to our tissues and it's arranged so that little tiny capillaries, I mean, our, our bloodstream has, a, our circulatory system has sort of big arteries and, and veins and so on. And then those branch into smaller capillaries and they keep branching, they keep branching. And as, as one grows, there are more, uh, uh, those, those capillaries keep forming and um, they get to the point where they're so small that they're within two millionths of a meter, basically, of any place in our body, there is some capillary. And that's important because when oxygen is delivered through our blood, it's getting into these capillaries and then it's diffusing, just the oxygen molecules are diffusing into tissues where they're used to let the tissues be able to operate and generate energy and so on. So, so conveniently, we have the system that delivers stuff to within two microns of any place in our body. The question is, if we wanted to freeze, uh, if we wanted to sort of get frozen quickly, can we use that to kind of get something to within two microns of every place in our body, and, and would that work? Well, people don't know how to do that yet. There are, it's sort of a problem of the physics of water as much as it is anything else. People talk about oh, all kinds of things with, uh, um, I've heard things about uh, liquid helium um, that, that has various kinds of viscosity properties that allow it to quickly get into different places, things like this, uh, different approaches. I've sort of imagined that there might be some approaches based on external electromagnetic fields that could have an effect on the way that molecules work and so on, different kinds of ideas, but nobody really knows how to do this yet. And uh, the there's also, it's easier for very direct reasons, it's easier to do it for a mouse than it is for do it to, for a human because a mouse is a lot smaller. And if you want to sort of get the cold into a part of the mouse, it is it sort of takes less effort to do that than it does with a bigger human, so to speak. Um, and but you know, there's there's the question of okay, if you froze all these tissues, um, what would be preserved? Would everything be preserved um, when you? if you sort of warm it back up again, and what would you have to do? You know, as you, as it's a, it's a, uh, a common feature of um, uh, various kinds of surgeries that you cool things down to, uh, to make sort of things happen more slowly. And um, clearly when you've frozen things, things like, you know, the heart isn't beating and so on because it's frozen solid um, and sort of uh, you have to think, how do you restart all these things? How do you get um, uh, how do you get the, the the system sort of back up and running? And will it will it come back in the form that 
it got frozen in. And for example, one question would be, will memories in the brain get destroyed by being frozen? Well, right now, the best sort of the, the it's still at the point where, um, where we don't know how to preserve any cells because they all have water in them and they all have this problem of expanding when they're frozen. Um, but the question of, for example, whether there's something about, let's say, human memories that will be destroyed by being frozen like that. Not known. My guess in that particular case is no. My guess is that the um, uh, that the way that memories are stored in the brain is probably through these little calcium channels that exist and things like that in the in the membranes um, between nerve cells, and that those are fairly rugged, robust things that won't be affected by by sort of uh, freezing the um, the operation of the organism. But we don't know that for sure. Um, so you know, I, I kind of think that. This is one of these things where one day somebody will just say, oh, we got cryonics to work. And it'll, it'll work because there's some exotic kind of chemical that's used that's, uh, that's infused into the bloodstream. And, and uh, uh, it might work pretty much like it works in the science fiction movies in the end. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of surprising that um, uh, rather little work ends up getting done on these things. Like sometimes... I think that science fiction movies are, are a double-edged sword in terms of the advance of science and technology because people see things in science fiction movies and they kind of get used to the idea of that's the way the future will be. And that provides kind of a direction for people to think about things for the future. But on the other hand, the fact that the thing showed up in a science fiction movie makes some kinds of kind of scientists say, oh, that's just science fiction we shouldn't actually try to do that. It's just science fiction, so to speak. So I think it's a it's sort of a complicated combination. And I kind of think cryonics is a little bit uh, the victim of um, it's been in science fiction, so it can't be real type thing. But my assumption is that eventually it will be real. And eventually it will be perfectly possible for us to just sort of say, oh, uh, you know, there's some medical condition which we don't know how to cure right now. Let's just get frozen for a decade and uh, wait until that's figured out and then um, uh, come back and, and be cured of that disease or whatever. Um, that will be very cool if that works. Um, uh, I, for one, uh, particularly because I'm interested in kind of science and things like that that has pretty long time horizons, I'd be really interested to see what happens a long time from now and uh, in sort of ordinary uh, without cryonics or something like that, one doesn't just doesn't get to see what happens in 150 years. It's not not a plausible thing. So, uh, gosh. well, let's see. Um, a lot of different questions here. Uh, sometimes you guys ask questions where I just have no idea what the answer is. There's a question here from Jamie. Is it true that cats domesticated themselves compared to other animals that humans domesticated for a purpose? I simply don't know. Um, the uh, uh, although it sounds quite plausible, um, it is an interesting question. What animals uh, sort of can successfully be, quotes, domesticated? And I suppose, you know, a famous example, I don't know how true this is, but it's certainly said to be true, is that while horses, while you can sort of tame horses, it's much harder to tame zebras, even though zebras are incredibly close sort of biologically to horses. But for whatever reason, zebras are uh, just sort of um, have enough of a different way of operating that they don't agree to have somebody put, a, you know, a horse bridle on them or something like that. Um, at least that's what, what I've heard. And so it, it does raise the question, what kinds of organisms are compatible with kind of uh, hanging out with humans? I mean, we see, you know, I don't think there are a lot of domesticated deer, for example, or I don't think there are domesticated kangaroos. 
Maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, I think that, uh, uh, and there are things like horses or dogs where humans found very specific purposes where those animals could do things that were useful for humans and humans could kind of interface with them well enough to be able to get them to, you know, on demand, go and sniff something or on demand, go and walk in this direction or whatever else. And I think it's, uh, it's an interesting question. What other kinds of organisms, what other kinds of animals uh, are in principle domesticatable or have attributes that we care about uh, domesticating? I mean, for example, there are plenty of animals with excellent senses of smell um, relative to us humans. Uh, dogs are the main one that we use for their sense of smell, but probably there are lots of others that um, uh, could also be used, but we haven't kind of gone through that path of domesticating them and understanding how to interact with them and so on. I mean, I, I do wonder to some extent, the, to what extent we bred something like dogs to be kind of ones, the, the, the dogs that were more suitable for us to interface with, and to what extent we simply learnt what were methods by which we could train dogs and by which we could essentially communicate with dogs um, and which sort of where the learning happened. Was it in the breeding of the organism or was it more in, in knowing how, for us humans, how we interface with the organism? I mean, I, I'm not sure it's, it's self-evident that you would like um, put a thing in the mouth of a horse or something to be able to tell it, you know, go this way or that way. Um, somebody had to discover that. Uh, and um, I, I kind of have a feeling a bunch of people got bitten by, by, by doing that, but that's, that's, uh, that would just be a guess. But I think um, in, um, uh, so, I, I mean, I do wonder quite a bit what, particularly in modern times, whether now that we have all kinds of sensors and all kinds of actuators, you know, I do wonder about, you know, if you put, sort of if, if you put some, some strange helmet on some kind of uh, critter, um, that that would be a sort of great way for us to interface with that critter um, or put, you know, put, I don't know what, on, or, or, or give or put, you know, um, little, uh, um, uh, you know, AirPod-like things in the ears of the critter, um, have it, uh, um, and, and you also don't know, you know, another thing that's super hard to determine is, well, does the organism, uh, and, and even it's not clear how one should feel about it, does the organism like to have, be in this situation or that situation? I mean, it, it, it appears to us that cats like to be, you know, uh, lying in front of a fire or something as created by humans. That is the impression is that, that cats like that, um, many cats like that, and cats don't like being, you know, dunked in water or something. Um, and uh, uh, but you know, this question of if we could find some some way of putting, you know, AirPods on the in on the um, I don't know on the elephant or something, uh, you know, uh, it might have a grand old time or it might not. And could we even tell if it was having a grand old time or not? And one of the things that is sort of an important observation about is that emotions seem to be a thing that is more or less conserved, that we more or less share with, with many kinds of animals. Um, and that's a thing, for example, Charles Darwin pointed that out, a sort of evidence for the evolutionary connections between humans and animals, that there were sort of shared features of emotional responses between, for example, dogs and, and humans, that you know, kind of the expressions dogs make when they're annoyed um, are similar to the ones humans make when they're annoyed. And so on, and that 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 kind of uh, uh, that we can kind of see a commonality between our emotional states and the emotional states of these kinds of animals. So we can reasonably say, oh, you know, playing that kind of music to an elephant, it's having a grand old time, versus doing that, it, it hates that. Um, and I think, but but I think it is a an interesting question whether with modern technology there are different kinds of uh, sort of domestication paths for animals that didn't exist before, um, and perhaps uh, ways that one could uh, uh, even, well, ways that one can learn from the animals 
or find out things from the animals in ways that weren't possible before, because we're just able to collect a lot more data and able to notice a lot more kinds of things. I mean, it, it's certainly within the realm of possibility that, you know, there are, I don't know, languages, forms of communication between animals and so on, where as soon as we notice that, as soon as we notice, you know, like bees have this kind of dance that they do um, that uh, uh, explains things to their hive mates about sort of where to go find, where to go forage for pollen and so on. Um, but one had to discover that that sort of dancing thing that bees were doing had some kind of communication purpose that we humans can understand. And so there's sort of a question for other kinds of animals. Is it just like, oh, we just didn't notice that this particular, you know, kind of um, uh, motion from cats, you know, that cats were doing this or that thing. I think cats are that excited about communicating with other, with other, with other cats. But but there, maybe something that's more of a pack animal um, might be more excited about that. But that that these things that they're doing that we didn't even notice are the key part of their communication process. I mean, like for for example, for uh, insects pheromones, the, the, these molecules that um, they are uh, uh, smelling, molecules that they can smell, that they'll sort of coat things with, or actually that's done by, by even dogs and so on too, that um, they'll sort of mark out territory with molecules. Um, and one kind of has to know to look for that um, before one can tell what, what's going on. And so there's certainly the, within the range of possibility that there are sort of features of the behavior of animals where we just didn't notice. And as soon as we notice, we're like able to say, oh yeah, you know, that means this or that thing in dog speak or whatever. Um, and uh, I, I've sort of felt that this is actually a pretty good application of some modern kind of data science, machine learning kinds of things to finally figure out. And, and maybe we'll discover that either there isn't any such language or communication, or if there is, it will be communication about things that are uh, well, they might be things about which we absolutely do not care as humans at this time in history. I mean, it might be the the dog is explaining, oh, there's a you know there's a green smell over there, or oh, that's a very uh, you know that's a very elegant collection of different smells that are coming from this this particular direction. Well, for us, it's like smell art of that kind is not something that we're normally into. So it's something where we might say, well, that's nice for, for the dogs, but we don't really care. Um, and one can imagine sort of forms of communication about things that are, yes, well, that's good. If you have a sensory system that has this or that characteristics, then that's something that um, will be important to you. But for us humans, where we're, you know, sight and sound and so on, it doesn't really matter much to us. So that, that's something that could happen. Or it could be that another thing that could be communicated would be, I don't know, the, the cats are communicating, oh, there's this complicated social hierarchy of cats. And, you know, it really matters that, oh, that cat over there is, is uh, you know, in this place in the social hierarchy of cats. And while that might be interesting to some zoologists or ethologists, um, eth um, ethnologists, um, it would be um, uh, it would be something where, for us humans, it would leave us kind of cold. Perhaps as perhaps as sometimes uh, for us old fogies, the um, uh, sort of the the social order of the younguns on various social media platforms and things leaves one a bit cold. Why do people care? You know, this particular configuration of followers or whatever else. And we might find if, you know, if we could communicate with the animals that they're obsessed with their, with their likes in, um, in, you know, in cat media, so to speak. Um, and we might say, that's, that's great for you cats. We just don't care. Um, and uh, I think, but, but it's an interesting question whether, whether there are kind of things where we could, uh, you know, we could decode what's going on in a way that we can at least provide something which is relatable for us. I mean, it's, it's the first question is, is there anything going on? And the second question is, is what's going on something that is relatable to us humans, where we can have the cat to human translator and have it turn into, oh, you know, that's a, um, I'm really keen on that kind of cat food. Or um, uh, did you know that, um, 
uh, you know, did you know that every day there's a mouse that comes out of that hole in your wall and, um, uh, you know, and comes and uh, eats things in, in this place or something, you know, you know, a cat bulletin, that's, you know, a thing that the cat can explain kind of thing. You know, those are things which might be human relatable, whereas there might be other things which are sort of uh, uh, forms of communication that we're just not going to uh, we're, we're not going to care about. Now, Now, having said that, one could imagine, let's say that the cat is extremely keen on explaining that, uh, oh, I don't know, there's some, a particular thing has, you know, if they rub their whiskers against this particular thing, the little electrical effect on their whiskers is really, really nice. And that's a wonderful texture. And, you know, get more of that kind of chair because it's it's a, a great place to, you know, rub whiskers or something. And, and we might say, well, as us humans, that's not really an important thing. But of course, in as, as for example, we get more, maybe not in that particular example, I, I don't really think that the human whisker, uh, uh, you know, technology is, is necessarily um, that uh, likely to come to pass. But um, one can imagine as we kind of have more sensory apparatus, let, let's say, for example, that uh, if we could talk to bees, they might tell us, oh, there's this amazing thing that you can see in the ultraviolet where they happen to, their vision extends into the, into the ultraviolet. There's this amazing thing in the ultraviolet and you should really care about this and you should build things that have these characteristics in the ultraviolet. And at, at this time in history, we might say we don't really care, but at some time in the future, when we all have, you know, augmented reality devices and things, and those augmented reality devices can perfectly well have cameras that see into the ultraviolet, um, that might be that our current visual system, which is normally fed just with visible light, is also routinely sensing what's happening in the ultraviolet. And so we might be, oh, yes, you know, we really now care about these things that the, that the bees have noticed and so on. All right, I think I'm going off into into um, uh, um, uh, very bizarre territory here. But I, I think for me, this whole question of sort of communicating with, uh, uh, with things that have a different view of the world is, uh, for me, it's an interesting thing because it helps us kind of understand how to think about, how to think about all sorts of things. I mean, in a sense, as we look at the progress of science, a lot of the important steps in the progress of science have to do with looking at things in a different way. And in a sense, we can get clues about that if there is some existing uh, kind of uh, tradition or something that sort of always looks at things in some different way, whether it's a human tradition or whether it's a, a tradition in some other organism or something, um, that's uh, that's an interesting piece of raw material for uh, uh, for us to make use of. I mean, it's it's something where, for example, the science we have mostly comes out of a, a sort of Western historical tradition. Um, it's not obvious whether there are things that can be woven together from other traditions that might be super useful for science. Unfortunately, by the time one has got a, a, a certain distance in one tradition, it's much harder to kind of attach things from other traditions because one sort of built this big tower of ideas based on one particular tradition and these other traditions just don't really attach to that in a good way. But that's uh, the kind of thing one might hope for. All right, I should, um, uh, I should probably uh, wrap up here for now, but um, thanks for joining me. This was a slightly, uh, we had some uh, going, we ended up going off into some slightly unexpected directions today. Um, but uh, happy to talk about all these kinds of things. I always uh, uh, learn things from, from trying to think things through that I don't usually think through. So thank you for priming, uh, for, for prompting that to happen. Um, and a reminder that um, you can send in topics you want to talk about on the uh, uh, on a form whose location I do not immediately know, but uh, hopefully somebody can put it in chat. Um, and uh, otherwise, look forward to seeing you 